On September 6, Hurricane Irma tore through the Caribbean island of St. Martin and destroyed our little piece of heaven on earth. I am not comparing our loss of a beautiful holiday destination to the tragic destruction of the lives, homes, and livelihoods of the wonderful people who inhabit this island. It cannot be compared. But both Jane and I mourned the loss of our special paradise. I met Jane while serving on the USNS Comfort, one of the Navy's Mercy-class hospital ships, immediately after the 2010 Haiti earthquake. The Comfort was in the Caribbean providing casualty relief. I was a second lieutenant with two months left of my six-year tour of duty, and I was ready to receive an honorable discharge and return to the civilian world. Everything turned out as well as possible. The time spent as an officer commanding a brigade of assistant drivers gave me ample opportunities for a decent civilian career. Jane was a recent college graduate with a nursing degree and a civilian volunteer on the ship helping with post-surgical recovery. We met when my team was troubleshooting problems in her room. I immediately fell in love with her beauty, slim athletic build, long blonde hair, blue eyes, and the most beautiful smile I've seen in years. I tried to strike up a conversation with her without seeming intrusive or interfering with her duties. The ship has a strict fraternization policy, but over the next few weeks, we had the opportunity to have lunch together several times. I spent enough time with Jane to want to get to know her better. She apparently felt the same way because she gave me her parents' address and her mobile phone number. We agreed to meet after my demobilization. Just a week after my resignation, I was knocking on the door of her parents' house in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Jane's parents, Paul and Rose, greeted me with friendly smiles. The four of us cooked a delicious home-cooked dinner. Rose, an excellent cook, Paul, an Air Force veteran who served in the 60s, putting aside inter-service rivalry and becoming immediate friends. Paul even gave me a tip for a job in Philly. The tip turned into an offer, which turned into a career. I must admit that my sexual relationship with Jane developed much more slowly than I would have liked. Rose and Paul were Catholics of the old school, and with Jane living at home, there were limited opportunities for realizing our growing love for each other. Jane was not a virgin. She had two regular boyfriends in college. Four months passed before Jane and I finally ended up in my bed. It was pretty vanilla, but wonderful. Jane's previous boyfriends apparently weren't particularly imaginative in bed. She was shocked by some of the things we did that first weekend, even though, like I said, it was all pretty vanilla. Jane and I got married ten months after I moved to Pennsylvania. We both had great jobs and decided we would wait a few years before starting a family. We used these years to save up good equity for a new home and to enable Jane to become a full-time mom when our children arrived. We also used these years to enjoy each other's company, emotionally and sexually. We spent our honeymoon on the Caribbean island of St. Martin. I was able to rent a 35-foot sailing yacht in Marigot, the capital of French St. Martin. We walked around the island and went to Anguilla and St. Barth's. Jane surprised me by spending most of her time between harbors sunbathing on the deck of the yacht. It's kind of stupid to put on clothes when no one can see us, isn't it? Surprising attitude towards nudity, given Jane's usually conservative attitude towards sex. The third night on the yacht was perhaps the most magical of my life. Jane and I finished with a delicious dish of red snapper, accompanied by a wonderful bottle of burgundy chardonnay. We laid out a blanket on the deck and looked at a million stars. Two shooting stars streaked across the sky. We made love, and when we finished, we fell asleep in each other's arms, the only ones in the world that night. Two days later, we sailed into a bay near the Bay of Orient. We reached the shore, and Jane was stunned to discover that we were on the nudist beach of Orient Bay. Rick, everyone here is naked. Jane was wearing the smallest bikini and was still overdressed. I decided to shock Jane and pulled off my swimming trunks. Rick, what are you doing? When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Well, not me. We walked along the beach along the naturist resort. Jane in a bikini, me in my birth suit. By the time we returned to the resort's restaurant, Papagayo, Jane had ditched her top but was still wearing her underpants. It was a unique experience. 
I swam to the boat and grabbed our towels, sunblock, and money. We took two sun loungers on the beach and a bucket of beer. Jane kept her panties on. Some parts of the body are only for my husband's eyes, was her only comment on this matter. It was a beautiful day. External sexual behavior is strictly prohibited, and there are no roaming groups of horny men trying to pick up women. It turned out to be much more relaxing than I expected. After a couple of hours, we swam back to the boat and vowed to return someday. A day in the sun with people watching my beautiful topless wife boosted my libido. Jane and I spent the evening on the yacht making love. We anchored off the pier on Pinel Island before sailing back to Marigot and flying home. In six years, from the honeymoon to Hurricane Irma, Jane and I returned to the island nine times. We either rented a sailboat or stayed in a condominium on Orient Beach, but never visited a naturist resort, although we did sunbathe on Club Orient Beach from time to time. Jane never changed her mind about full nudity, but her bikini bottoms shrunk considerably, sometimes down to thong size, while keeping her treasures hidden. We were already booked for our tenth visit when disaster struck. Photos of the destruction we found online reminded us of what we saw after the disaster in Haiti. Words cannot describe the destruction. A month after Irma, Jane was working at a clinic in town when she learned of an opportunity to help rebuild a clinic outside Marigot, the same non profit charity she had volunteered with in Haiti. Jane almost attacked me as I walked through the front door of our apartment. Rick, can you believe this? They need help in St. Martin. They are asking for qualified medical professionals to run a new clinic in Marigot. I already talked to my boss. He said that he would approve my leave. Wait a minute, Jane. How long is this for? From three to five months. And you didn't think we should talk about this first? Of course it is necessary. It just didn't occur to me that you wouldn't approve. I did not sign anything and did not undertake any obligations. Sorry if I'm a little hasty, I was just so excited when I received the letter today. What about our plans to start a family? You stopped taking your pills last month. Can we put this off for a few months? Only for a few months, I promise. We'll be careful until I get back, and until then we'll use condoms. Please. It took more than an hour before I finally agreed with Jane. This was more important than both of us. The people we knew and loved needed her help. I took a few days off to accompany Jane to St. Martin and help her settle into her new place. We landed on the island on Thursday and rented a car. Although we had rented a room for the weekend, our first stop was at the charity's office and our second at the apartment where Jane would be staying. We met Jane's neighbor, Allison Parker. We invited her to dinner, and the more I talked to Allison, the more I liked her. She seemed responsible, happily married in her early thirties, by the time we dropped Allison off at the apartment and headed to Orient Bay to check into our room, my anxiety levels had halved. On Friday morning, Jane and I went to the beach to go for a run. As we were running along the beach, a man ran towards us. We exchanged smiles and small waves. Nothing out of the ordinary, just the kind of politeness exchanged among fitness enthusiasts. Jane and I ran to the end of the bay and turned back. Halfway up, we approached the same runner. This time, he stopped. Good morning. To my surprise, Jane stopped. Good morning. The man extended his hand to me. Are you Americans? I returned his handshake. How did you guess? Just a wild guess. Clothes, friendliness. When I greeted you, accent. My name is Jean-Paul. I'm Richard. This is my wife, Jane. Jean-Paul extended his hand to her. Very nice. It's nice to meet new people. After Irma, the beach became so deserted, especially at this time of year. Jean-Paul stared at Jane for too long, but he couldn't blame him as she looked stunning in her bra and jogging shorts. When Jean-Paul asked how we planned to spend the day, I was annoyed that Jane had announced our intention to visit a nudist beach. Of course, he showed up that same day. He moved the lounge chair to the other side of Janey from me. He made sure she was watching as he pulled down his pants. For the next hour, he told us his life story, and I tried my best to stay awake. It turned out that he was a French citizen living in Saint-Martin to help rebuild the school and other damaged public buildings. 
local civil engineers were overwhelmed by the scale of the projects needed, and his Parisian firm sent him there to help the locals. When asked about his family, he replied that he was single. No wife, no children. I bought my first beer, and when I returned from the pub, Jean-Paul was lying on his stomach and looking at me with a grin on his face. Half an hour later, Jean-Paul offered to buy a second portion and left. While he was gone, I tried to engage Jane in a conversation that had nothing to do with our interlocutor. Just as I asked Jane about dinner, Jean-Paul returned with our beers. Jane turned to Jean-Paul. We were just discussing dinner. Maybe you can recommend some places? Our favorite restaurant closed after Irma. Let me take you to my new favorite place in Marigot. This will be my treat. I couldn't hide my annoyance, but Jane responded before I declined his offer. It is very kind of you. Can we pick you up on the way? That's how we ended our Friday evening with the Frenchman. The dinner was good, but I could have done without Jean-Paul's condescending attitude. Like many French people, he seemed to have a certain dislike for the Americans, especially our military. More than once, he made snide remarks about bad decisions made by the United States. I bit my tongue before agreeing with him. I wanted to say that we made a particularly bad decision when we worked with the British to kick the Nazis out of France. But I held my tongue because he might use my words to gain sympathy from Jane. This was not my first rodeo. Jane had a nice evening being the center of attention. Perhaps I should be more concerned about her flirtatious ways, but this is Jane we're talking about. This is a woman who has done the right things all her life and been a good daughter and wife. Jane and I took turns dancing. From time to time, I caught Jean Paul trying to rub himself against Jane, and whenever this happened, I intervened. This really infuriated him. When I finally told Jane it was time to leave, he tried to bait me with a snide comment. I would have left him there, but he came out with us, and I decided to take him home. When I stopped in front of his apartment, he tried to bait me again by kissing Jane. I'm sure she thought it would be one of those kisses on the cheek, but he kissed her on the lips, catching Jane off guard. I was glad she didn't kiss me back. I decided to avoid this jerk for the rest of the weekend. I implied that I didn't like this guy, that he was rude and disrespectful. Jane did not argue, and I decided that I had made my point. When it was time to board the plane, I tried my best to tell Jane I loved her and for her to be careful. During the first week, we talked on the phone almost every evening. She called me on Saturday afternoon, told me the staff were having dinner that evening, and promised to call me on Sunday. When we finally connected on Sunday evening, Jane seemed distant. She claimed that she was simply tired from a long week because she worked the first six days. Over the next two weeks, the calls became less and less frequent. By the end of the third week, I was getting worried and made plans to fly back the following weekend. We had a nice long talk on Thursday. I told Jane about my plans to fly in on Friday and stay until Sunday. But what I didn't tell her was that my flight home was actually on Tuesday and Monday was her birthday, and I wanted to surprise her. Jane met me at the airport with kisses and hugs. She told me I was in for a pleasant surprise. She had booked a bungalow in Phillipsburg. She said she was tired of living on the French side and wanted a change of scenery. It seemed odd, but I was determined to use the weekend to reconnect with my wife, and whining about her plans wouldn't get the weekend off to a good start. The first hint of trouble came when Jane took off her clothes that night. The light was low, but I didn't see any tan lines. That night we made love, with condoms, of course, but it was too dark to know for sure. I did a smart thing. I stayed up until she fell asleep and used the flashlight on my phone. Hell, no traces, not even a thong. The next morning, the weekend went downhill. When I asked Jane about her lack of tan lines, she became defensive and made up some story about sunbathing in privacy on their deck, adding, you do not trust me? I already started to mistrust, but I kept it to myself. It is difficult to determine the correct approach in this situation. Looking back, I should have grabbed Jane and brought her home. If she had cheated, perhaps I would have forgiven her, and we could have resolved the issue through counseling. Some couples can survive the betrayal of their husband or wife, 
but it takes two to save a marriage, and at this stage, I would work alone. We went about our business on Saturday and Sunday until I staged my departure from the island on Sunday afternoon. My original intention was to catch Jane at her apartment on Monday morning and spend as much time with her as her work schedule would allow. At least I assumed that we would have breakfast and dinner together. Now, after such a lousy weekend, I have reconsidered my plans. We said goodbye at the hotel. Jane to go back to her apartment in Marigot, I to go to the airport. The depth of our relationship is evidenced by the fact that Jane did not argue when I suggested that she not accompany me to the airport to say goodbye. She must have been in a hurry because she didn't notice that I asked my taxi to turn around at the first roundabout and follow her taxi. She drove straight to the apartment where we met Jean-Paul that first evening, more than a month ago. She didn't even knock on the door, but walked right in. I paid the driver and thought about what to do. It only took two minutes to decide to meet them, but I hoped I wasn't too late. I was about to knock on the door when I heard words that destroy it all hope. They probably wouldn't have heard me knock, given Jane's screams. I left and went to the airport, missing my Sunday flight, but managing to change my ticket from Tuesday to Monday. I checked into my room and got drunk. I think I slept no more than two hours. I can't say why. But for some reason, I got out of bed early Monday morning. I bought a bouquet of flowers and took a taxi to Jane's apartment. I gave $20 to the young man to take the flowers and the card I had bought earlier to her door. When he knocked, I was watching him from across the street. Allison opened the door, took the card, disappeared into the apartment, then handed the card back to the young man. He came back to me with flowers and a card. The lady said that your wife no longer lives there. She wrote a new address on the postcard. Sorry. He handed me a postcard and I saw Jean-Paul's address written on it. Do you want to get another 20? We can walk a quarter of a mile and get them there. Certainly. We walked without saying a word. I think the young man was embarrassed for me, a married cuckold. He knocked on Jean-Paul's door. I remained in the park opposite, but I saw the young man pass a card and flowers through the open door. When the young man returned, he only said, I don't think she's yours anymore. Sorry. Neither of them even bothered to put anything on before opening the door. I gave him a 20, and before we had time to leave, the apartment door opened and Jean-Paul came out, still naked, and threw flowers over the railing. That same day, I flew home and began to unravel our married life. On the advice of a divorce attorney, I documented our account balances, divided the funds, and opened my own accounts, removing my name from our joint credit card and checking account. My goal was to have everything ready before I told Jane about our divorce. If Jane noticed the lack of love and warmth during subsequent, infrequent phone calls, she did not say anything until the third week. For some reason, Jane decided to go home, but she didn't tell me why on the phone. Richard, you don't seem too happy about my return. What's happened? Jane, you've been gone for almost eight weeks. The separation turned out to be more difficult than I expected. You'll see, everything will change when you get off the plane. Let's wait until Saturday and then we'll talk. Jane seemed dissatisfied with my indifference. Was she really that delusional? I had no plans to meet Jane's flight home. I had no desire to look at her anymore, listen to her excuses or ask her reasons. My heart was made of stone and I had another difficult task ahead of me. On Friday evening I went to Rose and Paul's house. They welcomed me as their son, as they always do. Richard, what a pleasant surprise. We didn't expect to see you until Sunday. We are looking forward to meeting Jane and having Sunday dinner together. Rose, Paul, I'm very sorry to tell you about this. Jane has a lover in St. Martin. As far as I can tell, she dated him most of the time she was gone. This can't be. This is not our Jane. There must be some mistake here. No mistake. I was convinced of this the last time I was there. She moved out of her apartment and lives with a Frenchman she met there. Rose started crying. Paul looked like he was going to explode. I still don't believe it. It's some kind of mistake. Well, you can ask her when she arrives tomorrow. You'll have to meet her flight. I'm done with her. There are divorce papers in this envelope. She can ask her lawyer to contact mine. His business card is inside. If she insists, I can send her a formal notice. But I don't see the need for it. Everything we own is divided in half. 
Our apartment's lease expires in six weeks and the rent is paid in advance. This will give her time to renew the contract or remove her property. I threw the envelope on the sofa, turned and left. Of course, the next day there were calls and texts. Jane left messages begging me to talk to her. I only responded to messages on my own. Go see my lawyer. We're all over. The first time I saw Jean-Paul running towards us along the beach, something happened to me. How else can I explain all the stupid things I did from that moment until the moment I got off the plane at Kennedy Airport? Richard was the man I planned to love my whole life, who I hoped to start a family with, who treated me with love and respect. I repaid him with cruelty and disrespect. It all started when Richard and I stopped at the beach that first day. Jean-Paul was handsome, with the body of a Greek god, only darker. He was charming, but I didn't notice that his charm was directed solely at me, and I also didn't recognize his slight jabs at Richard. I stupidly blurted out that Richard and I were planning to spend the afternoon on the nudist part of the beach, so it was no surprise that Jean-Paul showed up that day, and I was pleased to think that I had attracted the attention of such a handsome man. He made sure I was watching him as he stood up to take off his shorts. Jean-Paul smiled at me as he sat down on the lounge chair to my left and continued to dominate the conversation, and I let him. I've always been a good girl. In school and college, I took my studies and football seriously, rarely attended parties, and the few parties I attended were ones that my parents would have approved of if they saw me. I was a virgin until my sophomore year of college, losing my virginity to a guy I dated for almost a year. I was heartbroken when we broke up. It wasn't until my senior year that a second guy pulled me into his bed. We only lasted a few months before I realized that I didn't love him, never would, and would only hurt him by delaying the inevitable. Six months passed after graduation when Richard came into my life. I was so happy when he continued our chase ship romance, knocking on my parents' door. Both my parents fell in love with Richard. My dad always spoke of him as his son. Richard was the perfect gentleman when we were dating, never pressuring me about sex allowing me to take my time to understand that he was my future partner before we made love for the first time. And it was love. I will never forget his look as he hovered over me and entered me. This look said, I love you. The following week, Richard proposed to me, with my father's permission, of course. It was a short engagement, a wonderful wedding and a honeymoon, just like in the movie. Our marriage was just as great and we were months away from starting a family when I blew it. My reasons for volunteering to help build the clinic were mostly altruistic, but not entirely. Two middle-aged nurses at work poured poison into my head, telling me how much I missed out on because I was a good girl and didn't experience all the joys of life before settling down. How could you get married so early? Have you ever wondered what it would be like to make love to someone else? These two snakes filled my head with doubts, and I was too stupid to understand that. They were single, divorced and jealous of my happiness. So I took the opportunity to step away from my life for a few months to make sure that pregnancy at 28 was really what I wanted. I won't embellish or lie, I was attracted to Jean-Paul. He invited us to have dinner with him in the city as a token of gratitude for allowing him to spend the afternoon with us. Richard didn't want to agree, but I agreed without consulting him. At that moment, Richard would have looked foolish if he had refused. We picked Jean-Paul up at his apartment, had dinner in town, and walked down the block to a dance club. That evening, my butt never touched the seat. Both men took turns dancing with me. It was almost a competition to see who could turn me on the most. It was almost midnight when Richard finally said it was time to go back to our room. Jean-Paul made a comment about Richard being a loser at the party. Richard replied, No. It's just time for me to be alone with my wife so that we can end the evening as a happy married couple should. I think this angered Jean-Paul. He seemed to take it as a challenge. Getting out of the car at his house, he kissed me on the lips. Jean-Paul tried to use his tongue. Fortunately, I kept my lips closed. I think the only reason Richard and I didn't quarrel that evening was because Richard saw that I didn't kiss back. The next morning, Saturday, Richard told me we weren't going to the beach so we went to the Dutch side of the island and had a nice lunch. 
That night we stayed home and made love. Richard was leaving on Sunday, and I was glad to spend the last night before our separation in his arms. On Sunday, I kissed Richard goodbye as he dropped me off at Allison's apartment. His last words before getting into his rental car were, Remember how much I love you, how much I will miss you. Be careful, love. That first week, Jean-Paul showed up at work to say hello and invited me to lunch. We had lunch together, and he dispelled my suspicions by acting like a perfect gentleman. When Allison warned me that day to be careful around Jean-Paul, I brushed off her concerns. Well, just be careful around Jean-Paul. Don't forget that you're married to a wonderful man. It was probably the worst thing she could have said at that moment in my life. On the first Saturday, the entire staff went out to dinner. Jean-Paul had apparently become friends with one of my colleagues because he showed up and sat at our table, charming everyone except Allison. Jean-Paul persuaded me to return to the same dance club where we spent the evening with Richard. Jean-Paul danced with me for the next two hours, practically having sex on the dance floor, only taking breaks to drink something else at our table. All pretensions to gentlemanliness disappeared after the second dance. His tongue found mine. His hands were on my ass or breasts whenever it seemed to him that we might go unnoticed. He took liberties with me that I never allowed Richard in public, and he took me to his apartment and got me. There is no other way to describe it. Jean-Paul used my body, and my body responded to him. That night I never had time to think about my betrayal. Every time my conscience began to torment me, Jean-Paul read my thoughts. After the first time, we lay together, me in his arms. Just when I was about to say, I have to go. He turned me over on my stomach and we had sex again. When I woke up, I saw Jean-Paul looking at me. Tu woke up. Without another word, he began the third round. We finished and took a shower together, playing with each other until the warm water ran out. Jean-Paul made coffee and cut a baguette for breakfast. He lent me a toothbrush. I wasn't surprised to see that he had a stash of cheap toothbrushes in his drawer. Seeing my expression, he simply gave me his wicked smile. Hurry up. We're going to the beach. I'll have to stop by and grab a swimsuit. How will I explain last night to Allison? You don't have to. You won't go home. What, do you have a collection of bikinis in another drawer? No. But you can wear one of my T-shirts until we get to the beach. You won't need a swimsuit on a nudist beach. But I never go without underwear, even if it's a thong. Today, everything will change. We actually went to a nudist beach, although not in Oriente. We went to Kupakoi, a beach that Richard and I had been to once before. Jean-Paul seemed to take pleasure in making me feel uncomfortable by pushing the boundaries. He spread our blanket next to a group of young people, I saw how the three of them, from time to time, glanced in my direction, and I went into the surf. Jean-Paul joined me in the water. When we were up to our necks in water, he tried to have sex in the water. For the first time, I refused him. He was unhappy, but resigned himself. I let him put sunblock on me, and it was almost a mistake. I felt a wave of desire. Let's get back to you. That's what we did, and we did it. This two more times before Jean-Paul brought me to my apartment in the evening. Once again, Allison said something wrong. I thought I told you to be careful with this man. He's going to ruin your life and ruin your marriage. I didn't need a moral lesson. I didn't say a word. I just went into my bedroom and closed the door. Over the next two weeks, I went back and forth between my apartment and Jean-Paul's apartment. And all this time, Allison treated me coldly at work. Finally, on Thursday, I had enough. Jean-Paul asked me to move in with him earlier that week, and until now, I was hesitant. Allison, Glenna is looking for housing. Why don't I move out and give her my own room? Is that okay with you? Allison breathed a sigh of relief. It suits me. When? Tomorrow. I spent the evening packing my things and talking to Richard on the phone. His voice sounded lonely, and it was not an easy phone conversation. I couldn't tell if he suspected something, but I tried to reassure him. We even agreed that he would come to us for another long weekend. Richard will check the flights and contact me. Now I had to figure out how to keep Richard away from Marigo, my work, and Allison. The weekend Richard came for was a disaster. 
Richard was trying too hard and I wasn't trying at all. As a result, I began to feel sorry for him, which led to my disrespect for him. I was almost relieved when Richard suggested that I not go to the airport to say goodbye. All weekend, my stomach was churning as I tried to hide the betrayal of our marriage. I hailed a taxi and went straight to the apartment I now shared with Jean-Paul. When I entered the apartment, Jean-Paul was already waiting for me. He lifted my skirt, took off my panties, and stuck his finger directly into my vagina. Did you use condoms all weekend like I told you? Yes, Jean-Paul. Okay, you belong to me. That weekend, the way I treated Richard, the way I disrespected him, denying him full access to my mind and body, all because Jean-Paul demanded it, led to the complete destruction of any self-respect I still had remained. On Monday morning, a card and flowers arrived from Richard. At first I panicked, thinking that Richard knew that I was living with Jean-Paul, but on the envelope I found Allison's handwriting, who was sending a postcard from my old apartment to the new one. Jean-Paul pointedly threw the flowers outside and then laughed as he read Richard's romantic greeting card before throwing it in the bin. On Saturday evening, we went to a club. Jean-Paul always bought drinks and we danced. At some point, his friend appeared and joined us. Simon was a slight Frenchman who worked in the planning department, and I had met him once before when I had lunch with Jean Powell. Simon asked me to dance. Come on, come on, have fun, Jean-Paul replied when I looked at him. Simon and I danced the first dance. When the second song began, Jean-Paul joined us on the dance floor. They held me between them, danced dirty, rubbed against me. Finally, one of the bouncers came over to separate us. We must have been very relaxed because I saw some horribly indecent behavior on that dance floor. Jean-Paul got angry when the bouncer told us to cool down. Let's get out of here. When we walked back to the apartment, Simon was still hanging around. Jean-Paul poured us tequila shots as soon as we walked through the door. Jean-Paul and I sat on the sofa. Simon sat at the kitchen table. Jean-Paul pulled off my top. The lights were off, and only the city lights breaking through the shadows made it possible to see anything. Jean-Paul put me on his knees facing him, continued to caress my breasts, then his hands climbed under my skirt. I felt a second pair of hands on my breasts, lips kissing my neck. When I woke up on Sunday morning, Simon was gone. Jean-Paul made coffee and brought me a cup. It was very rare for him to wait on me in bed. Last night was fun. Drink coffee? We're going to the beach. During the week, Simon came two more times. On Tuesday of the third week after Richard's visit, I felt strange in the morning and realized that I had missed my period a few weeks ago. I snuck into the clinic's laboratory while the technician was at lunch and took the test myself, which confirmed that I was pregnant. But how? At the time of the child's conception, Richard used condoms and Jean-Paul was protected. Condoms can break, but then a terrible thought occurred to me. On Wednesday, I placed a sample of his sperm under a microscope as soon as I arrived at the clinic. Jean-Paul's little swimmers swam in the sample. That son of a bitch was lying. He was fertile and, most likely, the father of my child. I ran down the street to his office and ran into him. I am pregnant. And what? It's yours, son of a bitch. You haven't had surgery, I checked, and you're fertile. And what? Get rid of it. Or better yet, take him and let Richard raise him. I can't ask Richard to raise your child. Don't you care about me and our baby? Shouting these words, I attacked Jean-Paul, striking his chest with my fists. Jean-Paul responded with a hard slap to the face, hard enough to send me flying into my chair. You are dumb? Did you really think that I cared about you? It gave me pleasure to make a cuckold out of your handsome sailor husband. Now you can go back to America and he can raise my child like a real cuckold. Get your shit out of my apartment and leave me alone. The slap and his words were like a cold shower. Suddenly everything became clear. My life had become a cesspool of immorality. The blinders came off my eyes and I saw what I had become. Am I too late to save my happy life at home? I reached the apartment and collected my things. At the clinic, I asked Joan if I could stay with her for a few days. I said that I was leaving home. Rumors about this spread within hours. Allison came up to me. Well, did he corrupt you? What? 
Did he sell you to one of the city officials? I warned you to stay away from him. He uses women as bribes to get preferential treatment for his projects. Why didn't you say this? I warned. But you didn't want to listen. You were too caught up in your dirty affair to listen. Good luck getting Richard back. I'm sure he knows what you've been doing here. But Richard loves me. I flew home on Saturday, wishing, hoping, and praying that Richard would forgive me so we could rebuild our life and love together. I was sure that I could return him. He really loved me. About three weeks after Jane returned home, her mother and father visited me, and it was a somber meeting. Rose and Paul were surprised by my lack of emotion until I stopped holding it in. This was right after Rose asked me, Isn't there something you two can do to stay together? You are so suitable for each other. I began to choke, but managed to say these words. I also thought that we were suitable for each other. But I heard them having sex, not even half an hour after we parted at the hotel. She practically ran into his apartment, and as I walked up to the door to face them, I heard them. I couldn't have been more wrong about what I heard, and I'm not going to live with a woman who would do this to the man she claims to love. I'm really sorry. After this meeting, calls and messages from Jane stopped. The documents were signed. After three months, our marriage became history. I didn't turn into a zombie and drink myself into oblivion every night. It helped that I had friends and family to talk to, and they mostly listened. With some of them, I talked about my desire to somehow make Jean-Paul pay for seducing my wife. It seemed unfair to me that he got away with everything. A few of my friends were interested in my revenge fantasies, offering ideas, but I don't think they took me seriously. My brother realized that this was not just a fantasy, and warned me not to do anything that could land me in a Caribbean prison. Even though my brother advised against revenge, the memory of the dark smile on Jean-Paul's face will not disappear until I do something. It took planning, but after two months I was ready to implement my plan. During these two months I radically changed my appearance. Gone was the business-like haircut and clean-shaven face. Now I wore a thick beard, and on the day of departure I shaved my head. I gained 35 pounds. After changing my sunglasses from round to aviators, I was completely transformed. I took the train to Miami and took a boat to Puerto Rico. So far, so good. I was in the Caribbean without any official record of my time here. Now comes the hard part, renting a sailboat without a credit card. This is where an old friend and a ton of cash came in handy. I had a backup plan, but I kept my fingers crossed that I wouldn't need it. Tony Albero and I served together on the USS Shiloh and have stayed in touch since he returned to his hometown near San Juan. When I knocked on his door, it took him half a minute to recognize me. Ten minutes later, we were already finishing our first beer, and Tony understood why I had come. You're not going to kill him, are you? I won't be an accomplice to murder, even if that asshole deserves it. I showed Tony the tools of my revenge, and it made him grin. Okay, I can agree to that. So, do you need a boat big enough to get you to St. Martin, but small enough not to attract too much attention? Tomorrow we will talk to Hector at the pier. Hector was more than willing to lend us one of the sailboats in his care once I showed him thirty hundred dollar bills. Tony and I set sail early Tuesday morning, just before the fishing boats left, sailed all day, and dropped anchor off Grand Case Bay by 2 a.m. At four in the morning, I slipped into the water and swam to the shore. When I reached the shore, I jogged the three and a half miles to the park across from Jean-Paul's apartment and sat down on the same bench I had sat on a few months earlier when I had watched my wife enter the apartment. I decided to take the risk of waiting and watching, hoping he was a creature of habit. At eight in the morning, a young woman left the apartment. At 8.30, Jean-Paul. I followed him at a safe distance. He entered the building. I checked the sign on the door. It was his work office. I jogged back to Grand Case and swam to our boat. Tony raised the anchor and we spent the day sailing around Tintamari Island. In the evening, we went to Friars Bay. Tony didn't even lower the anchor. I tumbled over the side with my tools in a waterproof case, and Tony swam out of the bay. At 7.20 in the morning, I returned to the park, and 35 minutes later, the same woman came out of the apartment. I waited 10 minutes, crossed the street, and knocked on his door. Jean-Paul answered the door with a towel wrapped around his waist. 
I didn't give him time to say anything before I shot him with the stun gun. He, of course, did not have time to recognize me. That was one of the problems. As much as I wanted Jean-Paul to find out who did this to him, I didn't want to go to jail. Maybe someday, after the statute of limitations has passed, I'll let him know, if it still matters by then. I closed the door behind me. While Jean-Paul was incapacitated, I tied him to a chair, forced him to drink a bottle of sedative water, gagged him, and attached the device. But something had to be done about his pride and joy. In the future, he will be able to use what is left of him, but it will be of little use for pleasing the ladies. It's a pity. I wonder if that will wipe the grin off his face. With any luck, it would be several hours before anyone found the bastard. By then, the damage will be completely done. I quickly jogged back to Friars Bay, swam to the boat, and late Thursday evening, Tony and I sailed back to Fajardo Harbor. By Saturday morning, I was home, shaved, and ready to diet. As for Jane's revenge, that won't happen for several reasons. First of all, I know she is suffering. Her parents have lost their son, and she will have to live with the knowledge that it was her fault. Secondly, I know that there is someone else for me, and living well is the best revenge, and someday she will understand what she gave up, our future, our children, and yes, the love we shared for the first six years together. And lastly, not letting her apologize was probably the most disgusting thing I could have done. That's my revenge, if I'm honest with myself. I moved in with my parents and started working at a hospital near their home while my belly grew. My parents forced me to go to a therapist, saying that this was a prerequisite if they would allow me to move in with them and help me take care of the child. It took no more than six sessions with a therapist to analyze where everything went wrong. Two harpies from my old clinic set the stage for this. I was immature and allowed their ridicule to fuel my narcissism, believing that I deserved and should get more out of life. I was scared that I would become a mother and be tied hand and foot. Finally, I was ready to fall in love with a charming seducer who was offering something forbidden. Therapy explained why I did it, helped me understand what I could do in the future, if I ever got another chance at love. But it didn't give me what I wanted more than anything. Another chance with Richard. Martin was born on September 6th, exactly one year after Irma devastated St. Martin. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.